The school of hard knocks. Everybody say the school of hard knocks. If you have your Bible, I want you to go to Romans 5. If you don't have your Bible, you can look at the screen, and it's going to become a big Bible here in about one second. Therefore, this is verse 1, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I have 25 minutes to preach this. Stretch your hands this way. Father, help me preach it in 25 minutes and help them get it in 25 minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. The school of hard knocks. How many of you have ever heard that phrase before? The school of hard knocks. How many of you have graduated from the school of hard knocks? <laughs> it was a phrase that was coined meaning learning life lessons through negative experiences. The school colors are black and blue. And <laughs> I heard that joke. I thought it'd go over well, and it did. Thank you for laughing. I appreciate that. And, and, and the, how many of you understand that in life, you cannot avoid hardship? Amen? You cannot avoid hardship. But in the natural, hardship oftentimes turns people bitter, turns them angry, turns them against God. But those of us in summer school who are disciples are not able to allow hard things to turn us bitter. You're not allowed to do that if you're a disciple. You're not allowed to let it turn you angry. Paul, in Romans 5, gives us a roadmap of how we're not to fall in tribulation, but rather how we're to grow in tribulation. And we're going to see that we're a part of an upside-down kingdom. First, we find that we are saved by faith. Everybody shout by faith. We're saved by faith. Paul says we've been justified. It means to declare righteous or the act of clearing someone of a transgression. Is there anybody in the room that is thankful that your life has been cleared of all transgressions? Come on, your life, if you are saved, if you have confessed Christ with your mouth and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you have lived life in obedience, your transgressions, everything about your past has been wiped clean. Now that means more to some of you than it does others, right? Because some of you have been good all your life. You raised in church, grew up in church family, then you got saved and you never had the opportunity to go and sin and fall into foolishness. But then there's some of you on the other side who weren't raised like that, weren't raised in church, weren't raised with the Christian family, fell into deep sin, addiction, pain, and God yet still rescued you. Here's the reality, whether you've been saved all your life or you came to know him after a lifestyle of habitual sin, we all meet in one place at the foot of Calvary where the blood of Jesus ran red for both you and for me that now my transgressions are completely wiped away, completely cleared. We have been justified by faith, not by works. Nothing I could do to earn it, certainly nothing I did to deserve it, I've been saved by faith. Somebody shout faith. Now, as I often tell you, because I want to preach the whole gospel, faith without works is dead. Meaning, I'm not saved by faith or saved by works, but because I'm saved by faith, I have to walk in works. My works don't define me. My works don't save me. Faith is what saves me and justifies me. Somebody say Amen. So what is the result then? We have achieved and walked in and have access to peace with God through Christ. Somebody say peace. peace. 
The word peace here is defined as completeness, soundness, or welfare. First John 2 and 2, he said, and he himself is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. The word propitiation just means the means by which sins are forgiven. So Christ became, for me, the means by which sins are forgiven. So peace equals reconciliation. Let me help you. Before you were saved, you were an enemy with God. Yeah? Some of you think God has enemies? Yes. Your life was in direct opposition to his life for you. And therefore, you were an enemy with God. But through Christ, we have been reconciled. All things have been brought back together. They make sense in Christ. Amen? Uh, one illustration I've used before is I, I'll have the band up here, and I'll have, you know, Matt will play one thing, and, and I think Austin was on bass today. He'd play another thing, and, and Derek or Wesley would play something completely off, and Danny would play, and it would just all sound like craziness. And then you throw in the drums and just have Andrew start banging on cymbals, and it's just craziness. But then you have them play the same thing, and it is beautiful and harmonious. That is what happened in the spirit when Christ reconciled you back to God. You were separate. Your life was chaos. You were completely and utterly confused. It didn't look harmonious, didn't feel harmonious. But the moment Christ reconciled you to God, your life came into harmony again. Somebody say amen. So now we have access by faith. We have the right to access or places to walk by faith into grace, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What is he saying? We rejoice in the hope of a future glory. Come on, I know a lot of our preaching is geared toward making it through this earthly, earthly life, but what are we making it to? We're making it to an eternal reward where he who overcomes will receive a crown of life and those crowns will immediately be thrown at the feet of Jesus because he's worthy. Come on, somebody. So I'm looking to a blessed hope is what Titus said, the great appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back for a bride without spot, without spot or blemish. Here's our first takeaway for the day. Number one, we are saved by faith. We're saved by faith. So first we're saved by faith, but then, and this is the part that nobody likes, suffering by faith. Romans chapter 1, verse 3. And not only that, we don't just... All, we don't just Rejoice in the hope of glory, but not only that, we also glory in tribulation. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because our hearts by the because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. So the first point, listen to this: tribulation trials are not because of a lack of faith, but they are because of faith. That's what Paul is saying here. Tribulation is not trials, pain, heartache, storms, whatever label you want to put on them are not because of a lack of faith. That's works-based salvation. Well, you wouldn't go through that if you had more faith. Baloney. Somebody tell Job that. Somebody tell Peter that. Somebody tell Paul Right now, that doesn't compute in a first century faith. But we don't want to suffer, so we try to deceive ourselves and numb ourselves by believing, well, I just got to have more faith. No! And then we're confused because when God begins to increase our faith, our troubles increase. Our tribulation increases. Because tribulation is not because of a lack of faith, but because of faith. So what are we to do with tribulation? Number one, we are to glory in it. Now, we live in a society that does not want to glory in their weaknesses. Some of you today, some of you right now, but I'm not going to call you out, are on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, wherever you're, well, X is what it's called now, whatever. You're on social media scrolling while I'm preaching. When you go home today, you will scroll on social media sitting on your couch and resting. 
and you will not see anybody's weaknesses on social media. You will not see anybody's weakness on social media. You will not see that they just had a knockdown, drag out fight with their spouse. You will not see that they are struggling to make the ends meet. Come on, somebody. You will not see. They will put a filter on their face because they won't tell you they're wrestling with self-esteem. They, they, highlight after highlight after highlight. Paul says, we are to glory in our suffering. We live in an upside-down kingdom. Jesus said, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And therefore, when I look at the world, whatever they are doing, I should be doing the opposite of. An upside-down kingdom. So where the world hates suffering, we are called to glory in it. We don't like this kind of gospel. We don't enjoy this kind of preaching. But what I'm telling you is, if we will learn to obey the word, the things we go through will have an immense effect on us spiritually. And we will grow through it instead of go through it. Touch your neighbor and say, grow through it, don't go through it. Go, grow through it, don't go through it. This word glory means to boast or to brag about or rejoice in. When is the last time you bragged about your suffering? Now listen, I don't want you to be a negative Nancy. Please don't be negative to everybody you meet. Give God the glory. Yes? Give God the glory. Well, I've got sickness in my body, but the Lord, he is good. I, 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 the devil's in my finances. He's brought, you know, he's, the stuff has started happening in our money, and, and I'm a little worried, but the Lord is good. Right now, the, our marriage, we got tension, and, and the kids, they had, you know, the stress, and, and school's about to start, and, but the Lord, he is good. We, we don't worship our tribulations, but we also don't have this unrealistic expectation that I'm the one who is able to get me through my tribulation. I'm not the one who's able to get me through it, so I glory in the, in the struggle. I glory in the trial knowing that he is able to deliver me out of the lion's mouth. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, Paul says it like this, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What an upside-down revelation. Come on, y'all are sitting here thinking, what is, what, why is he preaching this today? Because some of you are in the school of hard knocks right now. Walking through trials, walking through tribulations, walking through pain, walking through storms, wondering, God, why? And God sent a crazy preacher by to tell you, don't just simply seek deliverance. Ask God what he wants to do through what you're walking through. God doesn't waste anything. I don't believe that God sends sickness. I don't believe that God sends disease. I believe that the devil is a liar, but he's the prince of the power of the air, and sickness is a result of a fallen world. But I also believe that God will waste nothing. God wastes nothing. That's why Paul said in Romans 8 that God takes what the enemy meant for evil and he turns it for my good because he doesn't waste anything. All right, y'all ready? Put your seatbelts on. We're about to hit the gas pedal. So tribulation is a word that means affliction, suffering, distress, or trouble. So in the same way we rejoice because of the faith that led us to salvation, we are called to rejoice, keep our joy on in the midst of suffering. Suffering and tribulation is a major part of the Christian life. And I know that Christian television preachers and Facebook and TikTok prophets have convinced us that life with Jesus should be without heartache and without trials, but that's just not the case. 
It's just not the case. Uh, David, we find, rejoiced in affliction. One of my favorite scriptures, Psalm 119, 71, it is good that I have been afflicted, that I might know your word. There are certain things about the word of God that you will never know until you are in it with affliction. Come on, Romans 8, nothing will separate me from the love of God means something different to somebody who's walking through a trial. Come on, Daniel in the lion's den means something different to somebody who's walking through a disease or an illness or feel like they're surrounded by their lions. There are things about the word that you will never have revelation of until you walk through the fire and you come out unscathed. It's good. Somebody say, it's good. It's good that I'm afflicted that I might learn your statute. Does it feel good? Come on now. It's easy for me to preach when I'm not being afflicted. But when you walk through, it doesn't feel good. But that's why the word transcends my feelings. It's good that I've been afflicted that I might know your statute. So David rejoiced in affliction, the psalmist. James tells us to count it all joy. James 1, 2, and 3, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Here's our second takeaway for the day. We are to rejoice in trials. To rejoice in trials. Now, we're in the school of hard knocks, and so I just talked to you about trials, but hopefully you learn something, right? You go to school to what? Learn. So now I'm going to help you learn from the school of hard knocks. So first, about tribulation, we're to glory in it. Secondly, we're to grow in it. Everybody say grow in it. Grow in it. Romans 5, 3, and 4. And not only that, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces. Somebody shout produces. It means that was really lame for about 100 of you. Somebody shout produces. That was better. It means accomplish or implying something done with thoroughness. The reason sometimes trials last longer is God's just being really thorough. You laugh. Sometimes it's the truth. God wants to make sure that what he's trying to accomplish in you gets accomplished. I'm ringing just a little bit if we can pull me back in the house. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. So what is the produce of tribulation? Number one... It's perseverance. Everybody shout perseverance. Perseverance. The word perseverance here, it means endurance, patience, or the capacity to continue to bear up under difficult circumstances. James 1 and 12 said, blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. James 5, 11, behold, we count them happy which endured. And you've heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord was very pitiful and of tender mercy. Trials produce the capacity to continue. We're going to stop there and then we'll go the rest of the way. Trials, if you allow the Lord to have his perfect way, produce the capacity to continue. Sometimes your greatest weapon is just continuing to show up. What, think about blind Bartimaeus, all of his life on the roadside begging, and then one day, Jesus came by. Think about the lame man at Gate Beautiful for 40 years of his life who sat there unable to walk, begging people, going to prayer, and one day, two men full of the Holy Ghost walked by and everything changed. Imagine if they did not show up those days. Imagine if they gave up. Perseverance builds in you the capacity to keep going. Trials, tribulation develop the ability for you to continue to bear up under difficult circumstances. I don't know how much more I can take. I don't know how much further I can go. I'm telling you. That if you keep going and don't quit, you will make it. You will. Paul said in Galatians 6 and 9 that if, if we do not get weary in doing good, in due season we will reap if we faint 
not. If we faint not. So first it produces character or perseverance. Secondly, it produces character. Character defined is examination or, or means to try out by testing to learn the genuineness of something. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7 said, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. This word means to cause sorrow, to make sad, to distress or vex. And the word tested is the same as character, which again is to learn the genuineness of something. Continuing, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What's it tested by? It's tested by fire. By tribulation. See, the refiner's fire, when they would refine, they would take these metals, they would throw them in a fire to burn out the impurities. And once the impurities had been burned out, they would collect the metal and they would mold it to what they needed it to be. So when you're walking through trials, God is cleansing you of impurities so that he can mold you into what he's called you to be. Can I have that real quick? I want to show you something. So I didn't have gold, so I went with silver because Malachi talks about silver. Your faith, your character are put in the fire to burn out the impurities and to be molded into something that is more valuable than earthly treasure. And I got to thinking, I don't want to offend anybody, but I got to thinking about the difference between fake jewelry and real jewelry. And I got to thinking about gold plated over solid gold. And when you put pressure on something, it reveals the genuineness of the item. So, I have something with me. You got a wonderful knife. And I'm going to put pressure on this plate because from the front, it looks beautiful and silver and it's beautiful on dinner tables. And I mean, my wife is twitching because these are ours. <laughs> and, and I'm about to scratch it up here in a minute because you can put a good front on, but, un but when, not until, when, not if, when, Pressure starts to be applied. That's killing some of you. All of a sudden you realize this is not silver at all. This is, there's nothing real about this at all. And until your faith is tested, you really don't know how real your faith is. And there are a lot of these types of Christians who are about to get exposed when the shaking comes. And you put pressure on it, and the gold, the silver they thought that they were covered in just gets scraped off. I'm done. Y'all can unplug yours. It's done. But then on, on the flip side, I, I brought a piece of silver with me. And no matter how much pressure I put on this coin, it is only going to reveal that under the surface is more silver. It's only going to reveal that what's on the surface is actually all the way throughout. And what trials do, they come to test whether or not your confession has permeated your entire soul or if it's just a surface level confession. It comes to prove whether you've got a genuine faith or whether you've got a faith that can be scratched off by the tiniest of problems. You find out something's fake or real by putting just a little bit of pressure on it. Y'all with me? And then lastly, character then turns in to hope. Everybody shout hope. Hope. And I'm going to do this so it'll help me close. Stand with me all over the room. I need somebody to help me come play. Are y'all receiving the word this morning? Watch this. Hope defined is like this, to look forward with confidence to that which is good and beneficial. So after I have learned to continue and to bear up under difficulty, after the genuineness of my faith has been proven, 
I now look forward into the future recognizing there is hope where there once was despair. And unfortunately, in the testing and in the capacity expansion, that's what you need to call your storm. I'm just expanding my capacity to keep going. That's what you need to call that sickness or that trial. It's, it's a capacity expanding season. And unfortunately, in those seasons, we fail and we oftentimes lose sight of a future that is containing hope. But Romans 5, verse 5 said, hope does not disappoint. Come on, somebody say, hope does not disappoint. That means to humiliate or make us shame. True hope does not make us ashamed. Because our hope is not in our surroundings. Our hope is not in our circumstances. Our hope is in the sure promise of God. And with my hope in his promise, I can never be put to shame. Here's, here's our third takeaway. Trials come to help me grow. You've got to reframe the way you see your tribulation. It comes to help me grow. Head bowed, eyes closed. Holy Spirit, I thank you that even in these short 25 minutes that I've preached your word, that your word at the entrance of your word is light. And Lord, I thank you by your word we receive strength, and we receive hope for a future. So I pray that in these 25 minutes, you did more in 25 minutes than I could do in an hour. You spoke to the hearts of men and women walking through tribulation, living in the school of hard knocks, trying to learn lessons. I come against bitterness. I come against hopelessness. I come against anger. And I thank you that they're not going to go through it. They're going to grow through it. And we give you thanks in Christ's name. And everybody said amen. And amen. Put your hands together. I want you to listen to me.